Hello, my name is Patrick Allen, and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress, and it's conducted through the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library under the direction of Brian Powers. And today is March the 31st, 2024, and we have the pleasure of interviewing a Vietnam Army veteran by the name of Mark Deem. Mark? Thank Pat? you for this interview. Thank you. And we're doing this interview at his home at 2817 Summerfield Trail in Sydney, Ohio. Mark, uh, before we get started on your military career, let's uh, talk, talk about your family history. Uh, tell us where and when you were born. I was born here in Sydney on October 18th, 1947. <coughs> Got a twin sister, Marcia. My parents did not know if they were having twins, so that was kind of a shock to them. <laughs> <laughs> and, what, and your sister's name was what? Marcia, Marcia? Schaefer. Um, and how about your mom and dad? Which, what was your dad's name? William Deem, William H. Deem. And your mom? Mary. Brockman was her maiden name from Anna. Uh, do you have any inkling of uh, how they met each other? You know, I really don't. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you remember when they got married? Or they got married January 18th, 1947. Okay. So uh, what did your father do? Well, he started out, his, his, his father, Emerson Deem, was the mayor of Sydney two different times in the early 1930s and again in the like 1950, 52 to 55. And then he, he had an insurance agency in town, but he was involved in, oh gosh, when he was younger, he, was, he had a car dealership. Uh, he, I think he worked at Dunson's at one time. He, he did a lot of different things, but in the end, he was an insurance agent. All right. <clears throat> and your, your father, uh, was he in World War II? He was. He was, uh, he, he was drafted by his father, who was the chairman of the draft board in Shelby <laughs> County. Okay. So, <laughs> So he was drafted and he went to basic and he was going to be in the combat engineers and they were looking for pilots and he thought maybe flying might be better than walking. So he volunteered for flight school and ended up being accepted into that and ended up being a B-26 pilot. All right. In the European theater, 394th bomb group. Uh, do you remember where he flew out of? Uh, on D-Day, they flew out, out of Chelmsford, England. Okay. But their planes didn't have a real long range, so after D-Day, they moved to southern England, because Chelmsford was up maybe 60 miles northeast of London. So they moved to southern England, flew out of there for a short while. Then as the uh, ground troops kept moving further inland, then they kept moving and setting up temporary bases. So, over on the continent. All, over on the continent, yeah. They just had, A-13 was a, was a field they had. They just put down these metal lasts or strips or something for landing and they right. had tents. And they were following Patton is what they were doing. They were supporting General Patton. Uh -huh. So as he kept moving further, they kept staying close as they could to him. Uh, did he ever tell you how many missions he had? 65, which was a maximum for B-26. And obviously he made it through all 65. Did he have any injuries? He didn't have any injuries, but they did have to bail out once. They were on a mission in, I think, in Germany somewhere. And there was a weather front moving in, and they told him they should be back before that weather front ever get, got there. Well, that didn't turn out to be the case. They ended up coming back, and they were icing up, and they, they tried to get above it. Uh, I think they tried to get below it first, where they could see, and they couldn't. And they knew there were mountains in the area, so they tried to get above it. And eventually, they ran out of fuel, and they had to bail out. And what country were they in when they landed from the bailout? Well, they were in France, but they didn't really know where they were for sure. They were hoping they were in France, uh -huh. <laughs> but they were in France. So. Okay. <laughs> and uh, he was able to reunite and uh, get back to his base? Yes. Yep. Good. I think there was a local farm or something there that kind of picked him up, and then they knew where to take him to mm -hmm. get him back. Good. Good. Um, did, did he fly uh, after the war at all? I think he said he might have flown out of Sydney one or two times, you know, but that was about it. Now, your mom's name was Mary. What was her maiden name? Brockman. Brockman? Brockman. All right. Did, did, out of Anna. Do you know how, uh, um, well, they got married, what did you say, 46? 47. 47. January 18th of 47. Okay. 
And uh, did they live here in Sydney when they got married? Yes. So tell me a little bit about your twin sister. Is that uh, Maria? Marcia? Marcia. 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 Yeah. M A R C I A. Yes. Her last name now is Schaefer. Schaefer. Yeah. Her husband's Dan. They live here in Sydney. They'd go to Florida in the winter and spend the winter down there, but they're they're back now. Uh, did your mom uh, work outside the home? Uh, she she didn't. Well, she she did before they were married. She worked down at Wright Patterson Air Force Base with okay. a couple of friends of hers. All right. And uh, then after after we were born, and she she didn't work at that point. And after we grew up, then she worked as a teacher's aide for uh, Sydney City Schools. In Sydney Schools. Yeah. Good. Um, <clears throat> now uh, you had a another brother, Tommy. That passed away? Right. He was born in 1956. In fact, his birthday just would have been three days ago on the 28th of, of uh, May. But uh, we, Dad worked at that time, well, he worked at Montgomery Wards here in Sydney. And then in 19, let's see, probably 57, he went to work for Mack Truck, was here in Sydney. Okay. Well, he worked, he was a personnel officer, and he worked there for two years. And they got a new uh, president now in Allentown, Pennsylvania, in the home office. And he decided he didn't want a Mack truck plant in Sydney anymore, so they closed it down. And he was offered a job in, out, out by Allentown, Pennsylvania. Uh, my college roommate was from Allentown. Oh, yeah. So we lived out. We lived actually outside of Allentown, but where he worked was in Allentown. Mm -hmm. So we lived out there four years until my grandfather passed away, and then my grandmother wanted my dad to come back and take over the insurance business. Okay. So we moved back then in 1963. But Tommy, uh, when we were out there. Uh, he he had his tonsils taken out and everything went fine. He was three years old at that time, so this would have been 59. And uh, the next day, his heart just stopped, and they tried to revive him, and they they just couldn't do it. And they never really wow. knew why he died. They just said he had a weak heart. That's wow. You know, today that probably wouldn't have happened, but uh, it, at that time it did. So you would have been what 12 years old at the time? Yes. So did you go to school out there in Allentown? Well, it was actually Center Valley. It was a little town outside of outside, maybe six, seven miles outside of Allentown. Southern Lehigh is where we went to school. Okay. And when you came back to Sydney, were you still in elementary school? Oh no, this was junior high out there, and then the tenth grade when we came back to Sydney. Okay. And you went to public school here? Yes. Uh, at that time, were there two schools, uh, Sydney Public and then Sydney Holy Angels? Yes. Um, <clears throat> And did uh, Marcia go to the same school? Yes. Uh, tell me a little bit about Marcia. Did uh, she graduate high school? Did she go on yeah. to any further education? No, she went to work for, well, let's see. <laughs> she worked at United Telephone most of the time. Uh, she may have worked a few other places, too. I, I don't remember. Some of that time I was in the service, so I'm, I'm not sure you know, what she did then. But most of the time she worked at United Telephone as a secretary. Uh, what was her husband's name? Dan. Dan? Uh-huh. Uh, is Dan still living? Yes, he is. What, uh, what kind of work did Dan do? Well, he worked, in, he worked for Stolly's uh, for a long time uh, here in Sydney in management. And then he, uh, he went to Cincinnati. They moved to Cincinnati, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago and worked for a company down there. And then they moved over to Indiana. Uh, he was uh, down in the river, uh, Madison, Indiana. He was the president of a company over there for a while. That's a nice little town. And then uh, when my, let's see, I guess it was when my mother passed away, then they ended up moving back to Sydney. Stolly, was that Stolly Brothers? No, Who, it was Ralph Stolly. Ralph was, Stolly? Uh, was the owner of it. Uh, they had a big, they had a lot of businesses here in town. Uh, it was a manufacturing company, yeah. wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then do you have a, a, another sibling, John? John, yeah. And so John was born in 1960. Okay. So he's quite a, he's 13 years younger than we are. All right. And where does John live? He lives, he lives where my dad did, actually. He bought his house when dad passed away. And what kind of work does John do? Uh, he works for... The uh, what's the name of it? The garage door company that's out of Rushi, but they got a plant down in Troy. So he does, he does phone calls for people wanting wanting to help on how to install something. Is that Clopay? Clopay, yeah, that's it. C L O P A Y. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
So he's been working from home most of the time. I think they're just now starting to talk about going back into the office. So he's been able to not have to drive to Troy every day. So that's, <laughs> that's been a benefit. That's good. That's good. So uh, when did you graduate Sydney High? 66. What did you do after? Well, let me, before I ask you about graduation, did you work at all while you were in uh, high school? No. Uh, did you play sports? I played golf. Okay. I was also in Sydney had an all boy band. I was in the band for three years. All right. It was a great experience. Uh, when we lived in Pennsylvania, we lived pretty close to a, a golf course called Saucon Valley Country Club. And there's been some senior tournaments, PGA tournaments out there. Uh, at that time, they had two 18 hole courses and a six hole course. And I was at work there as a caddy. So I was going to ask you if you did some caddy. Yeah, we ride our bike over there, and, and then they, had, they give you little buttons. And they draw each morning, and uh, the way you came out of there is how you got whether you, when you got called. Okay. So if you got real late, chances are you weren't going to get called at all. So you just go back home, you know. But, yeah. So I did that for a couple of years, and then we moved back here. So. <laughs> so, uh, what kind of money did you earn there? Was it all just tips by the golfers, or do you get paid by the course at all? <sighs> Boy, that's a long time ago. <laughs> I'm thinking the course might have given you something, and, okay. and the, the, the golfers tipped you something, too. Good. You, I wasn't getting rich, but... <laughs> and I could have played golf on Mondays for nothing, and I never played golf then. And these were beautiful courses. <laughs> uh -huh. did, did your dad have time to play golf at all? He started playing while we lived out there, mm -hmm. but he never played there. I think a lot of people that belong to that worked at Bethlehem Steel. I always thought Bethlehem Steel owned it, but I don't think that was the case. But a lot of executives at Bethlehem Steel, that's where they belonged. Okay, so what, after graduation, what did you do? Well, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And our, our principal, Glenn Charles, stopped me in the hallway one day and he said, what are you going to do after school? I said, I don't know. He said, the Ohio Department of Highways is looking for people to hire. Why don't you go talk to them? So I did. And I ended up going to work there on a survey crew. And I worked there for about a year and two and a half months, and then I left for the service. So now, did you uh, did you enlist or were you drafted? I was drafted. Where did you uh, Where did you report to? Well, I guess we went through a fees in Cincinnati, but they picked us up here in Sydney. At uh, there were five of us from Shelby County that went that day, and then we stopped in Miami County on a bus and uh, picked up. I think we were 15 or 16 from Miami County. We picked right. up. Then we went to Cincinnati. Got down there for your physical and. Well, we already had the physical at this point. You had the physical yeah. up here in Sydney. No, the physical was down there, but okay. that was earlier. That was like months earlier. Okay. So, so then, from from Cincinnati, where'd you go? Well, then we, f we flew to Atlanta and then got on buses and went to Fort Benning, Georgia, which is where I took basic. Had you been away from home before that? Nope. <laughs> uh, did you stay with the fellows from Sydney or did they split you up? Uh, s some of us were, one guy, one guy's father was the administrator at the hospital and we were in the same platoon in basic. Uh, the other three guys, I don't think they were in a different. They were in a different group. All right. But there were guys from Miami County. I got to know. Got to be good friends with them. And what'd you do down at Fort Benning? Basic combat training. <laughs> a lot of running. A lot of exercise. What time did you get up in the morning? Oh gosh, the week before I was ready. Uh, I don't know what time they got us up. Probably, I don't know, five, six o'clock. I don't really know what time they got us up, but it was oh. early. What, what, what was your average day? Would, they, would you wake up early and then eat and then exercise, or what, uh, what happened? Yeah, usually the first thing you do is, is go to the mess hall and okay. eat, and then... Uh, How was the food? You hardly had time to taste it. <laughs> they give you like five minutes or something. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it was pretty quick. Uh, it was okay, as I recall. I don't, I don't really remember too much about it. <clears throat> How long were you down at Benning? About eight weeks. And then where did you go? Well, then I was going to come home and get married, but three days before the end of basic, I got orders to get on the bus and go to Fort Polk, Louisiana for infantry training. I read about that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I did. <laughs> uh, Fort Polk, what was that camp like? Uh, it was probably a good time of the year to be there. This was the end of October through the end of December, or mm -hmm. middle December, I guess. So it can be very hot down there in the summer, but at that time of the year, I mean, it was still warm, but it wasn't like I'm sure it was in August or July or something. What so, unit were you in? What unit? 
I was in Echo Company. I don't don't know the rest of what it was. You, um, it was it was really like basic training all over. The only thing different with that is that we fired a lot of different types of weapons. Okay. Because basic training, we had M14s. I think we maybe threw grenades. That may be about all we did as far as weapons in, in basic. Did you have any idea you'd be going to Vietnam at all? When I went to Fort Polk, I had a pretty good idea that's probably where I was going to be going. <laughs> did they have any kind of a, a Vietnam simulation area where you trained? Like I, I think for so. jungle warfare? Yeah, I, I think they didn't really have jungles, but you know, they had escape invasion things you did and a lot of stuff like that. We had M16s at that place. and. How long were you at uh, Polk? About another eight weeks. How was the grub there? Did you have time to eat it? About the same. It was, <laughs> like I say, it was like basic all over except the different, different uh, weapons that we fired. So uh, how did your fiance take uh, not getting married and going to <laughs> Polk instead? I wasn't here. I don't know. <laughs> what, well, how'd you tell her that you weren't going to be able to do that? Well, phone calls all you had. Uh -huh. Actually, a, a guy that lived right beside her that we went in, in basic together, he told her before I did. <laughs> I think he had called home. Maybe he called home and talked to his parents or something, and, and uh -huh. they told her or something. But so it wasn't a bolt out of the blue when you called her. <laughs> <laughs> so from Polk, where'd you go? Well, then I did come home and get married. <laughs> all right. Where, where'd you get married? In Sydney at the Methodist Church in the chapel. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was just basically had family and, and a few friends there. It was mm -hmm. small. Because she already had a plan once and it was canceled. And yeah. So, <clears throat> so we got married on December 16th. <clears throat> I kind of just about didn't get home. <laughs> I went to, uh, when I went, left Fort Polk, there were different places you could go to fly out of. And I went to Houston, Texas because a guy that we had seen like, Two years earlier was a, was a co-pilot, or dad was actually the co-pilot, and this guy was a pilot. And we'd just seen them in Houston a couple couple years before that. We visited them down there. So I went to spend a little time with them before I flew out. So they took me to the airport in Houston, and I flew out. And I, I don't know where I went, somewhere down south. I don't know if it was Alabama or Mississippi or somewhere. But I went to an airport, and I was supposed to change planes there. Well. That plane was coming from western Texas where they had a snowstorm. So that plane didn't come in. So I got stuck in that airport all night. Oh. A friend of mine from Versailles who I met at, at Fort Polk, he went a different route because he went. He thought he'd get home a little bit earlier than I would. So he went a different route. So the next morning the plane comes in. I get on it. The first stop is Atlanta and I did not have to change planes. So I'm sitting there and all these people are coming on and I look up and here comes Neil Hannon walking on. He got stuck in Atlanta overnight. <laughs> So we flew from there to Cincinnati. We were supposed to get a plane from Cincinnati to Dayton, but of course that plane was long gone. So somehow his sister found out what was going on and she was from Versailles and she drove to the Cincinnati airport. Well, I think a friend of hers was with her. So they picked us up and they dropped me off at the Dayton airport where my parents were still waiting, not knowing what was going on. <laughs> and Joyce said it called her dad to come down and get her and bring her back because she had an appointment there again, not knowing what was going on with me. Sure. So I get back into Sydney at about 1130 and she's just coming out of the hairdresser place downtown. We still had to go to the courthouse and get our marriage license and we got married at 330 that afternoon. <laughs> so it was a... That was a quickie. That was, that was a quickie. <laughs> So you didn't have time for a honeymoon because you were going to be going back out. Well, we we did. We went. We went. To, we actually went to Allentown, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Just went out there and spent a few days in okay. the hotel out there and saw some places where I'd lived, you know, a number of years earlier. And then we came back. So I was, I had a two week leave. So two weeks. Two okay. weeks. So January third, I had to report to Fort Lewis, Washington, thinking I'm going to Vietnam from there. Well. I get there. Well, let me. Okay. How, did you, how did you get to Fort Lewis? I flew from Dayton to I don't know where, maybe Chicago, and then to SeaTac Airport. Was that the commercial or was that a, a military flight? Commercial. Yeah. All right. It was our responsibility to get there. I think they gave us some kind of travel pay, maybe to pay for it. <clears throat> so you get to Fort Lewis. I get to Fort Lewis, and I'm in a reception center, and I wake up early in the morning, and I look out the window, and there's snow on the ground. And it's, it's kind of light, and I go back to sleep, and I wake up later, and the grass is green. I said, How, what's going on there? <laughs> well, 
so out there it doesn't really I always thought Washington being that far north would be a lot, lot colder than it is here but it wasn't because they got all the, the Pacific Coast there uh, it was warmer there so there was snow but it, it all melted off so uh, I found out the next day then that there were a whole bunch of us that were all going to come there and we were all going to go to the American Division as a replacement. So we were staying there for a while. No idea how long. Ended up being a month we stayed there. What are you doing during that month? <laughs> they gave us, of course, Washington, it rains in the winter, it rains all the time. So they gave us wet weather gear and we set out for classes that we had just done at Fort Polk. They were just trying to keep us busy. Uh, what were the accommodations at uh, Fort Lewis? Well, that was pretty nice here. They had three-story concrete block barracks, which I had been, both places I had been were both World War II barracks, old wood barracks. Now, at least Fort Polk, which probably needed it the least, they had gas stoves or furnaces in them. The other place had coal furnaces at Fort Benning. Mm. What did you have at Lewis? What did you have at Fort Lewis? It was, it was three-story brick, concrete block. Uh, How about heat? Probably gas, I would guess. I don't know. I okay. mean, nobody had to take care of anything. It was just okay there. <laughs> so it was pretty nice there, nicer than where I've been. The food there decent? Probably the same stuff I've been eating. <laughs> Maybe I had a little more time there. I don't know. <laughs> so after you've been there about a month, then what's your assignment? Well, at the end of the end of January, we had a captain that was in charge of us, and he didn't know what to do with us. He was just, they were just trying to keep us busy. So he said, anybody married wants to go home on a six-day leave, you can go ahead and go home. So I came back to Sydney for six days, and when I got, then he said, anybody else could go when we got back. Well, we got back, and the orders had come. So February 5th, we left on three C-141 Starlifter cargo planes, which had seats in them backwards. And no windows. I think there was one window in the back. You could. That was it. So, <laughs> so we were packed. So you took those from Fort Lewis. Where did you go? Did you go to Japan or Hawaii? No, we went. We stopped in Hawaii at night. <laughs> at, it was in the night, early evening probably, and we stayed there for a couple hours. We were on the ground. So we all got off, and then from there we flew to Wake Island. We got there early in the morning. I went down by well, there again. We were on the ground for a couple hours, and. So I went down by the ocean and just had a few pictures down there. That's a small island. I mean, that was during World War II. That was a strategic uh, island, yeah. you know. But boy, it's not very big. You can see all the way across it. And then from there, well, when, when you were there, now this would have been in the '60s, and this is uh, 25 years after the Second World War battle there on Wake Island. When you were on the beach, were you anywhere near any remnants of World War II? Any sunken ships out in the bay or no. anything this, like this that? This was on the beach. There were rocks and stuff down there. Okay. Just walk down there to have something to do. And No, I didn't really see much at all there. <clears throat> Air Force was there. I think that's probably all that was there at that point. Okay. And uh, then we, from there we left and we stopped at Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. So for some reason, and I still don't know why, we stayed there for 23 hours. So they put us up in barracks there. And uh, why we stayed there that long, I don't know, but we did. And the next How morning, was the weather in the Philippines? <clears throat> now you'd had some snow up at Fort Lewis. What are you having down in the Philippines? Was it, it, was it hot and humid? Uh, I assume it was. I don't really remember. But I know when I went to the mess hall the next morning, I knew I was in the wrong branch of the service because it was an Air Force barracks or an Air Force mess hall, and it was huge. And you went through there, and they're asking you what, what you want to eat and all this stuff. And my goodness, that's nothing like what I was used to. <laughs> they just go through a line, and whatever it was, it was. You know? uh -huh. <laughs> so this was nice. So then after 23 hours, we left there, and we landed right in Chulai, South Vietnam, which is where the America Division was. Okay, let's, you wanting this let's, map? let's get our map. Uh. So now let's uh, okay. let, let Mary get focused in on this. Can you see that or is there a... I see it pretty well, yeah. All There's right. light on it, but that'll have to be... Turn it a little way to get the glare off of it? And yeah. better? Yeah. And yeah, put the glare at the top. Good. That's good there? Okay. Oh, this is true lie? Uh, yes, it is. That's where you landed? That's where we landed. And uh, when you got off the plane, what was your first... 
reaction was I was, it? I was, it was everything was so green. Okay. And it was hot. <laughs> it was hot and humid, and, right. and everything was so green. But we went, uh, of course, the, the airstrip was right along the beach, not too far off of it, and there was a sand dune between the beach and where the airstrip was. So we went right across the sand dune to the beach, and they had what they called a combat center there. It was an orientation thing. So we stayed there on the beach in a tent for like three days maybe and went through all this orientation uh -huh. about you know wild animals and bugs and all this stuff. And so then from that point, then we all went to separate, separate units. What were your duties at that time? In a reception center? No, what, what, you're over there in Vietnam. What, what are you doing? Oh, I was in the infantry. Okay, so, so I ground pounder? I was a ground pounder. Okay. So I joined a company, it was Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 6th Infantry, 198th Light Infantry Brigade, America Division. All right. So they, at that time, they were a little bit south of July at a place called LZ Gator. And it, it isn't going to show up on here, and it's not real far south. I'm not even sure how far south it was, but so we probably rode trucks or jeeps or something down there. Some of us went there, some of us, that's where the battalion, the 1st of the 6th Battalion was located at that time. So anybody going to the 1st of the 6th Battalion went there. Other people went different places depending right. on where they were. So I was there overnight, and then the next day, our company, our battalion was up at LZ Baldy, which was about 15 miles south of Da Nang. So, Da Nang's about 60 miles north of Chulai. Da Nang, yeah. yeah. So we were about 15 miles south of there at a place called LZ Baldy. And this is, this is February of 68. So Tet had just happened. Our company had been up defending Chulai before I got there. And so th what, what's the letters LZ stand for? Landing zone. Okay. Or sometimes they're called fire bases. Well, t tell me about uh, LZ Baldy. Uh, was it a large... Uh, concentration or was yeah. it just it was very large we we might have been attached to the first or the 196th brigade at that time we were in the 198th brigade but our battalion might have been attached i always thought we were because that's where they that's where the 196 was at was at lz baldy so we were there for well the first i'd say the first three or four days some of us new guys were there they didn't take us to our company yet our company was out in the field so they'd sent us out in the morning with minesweepers. There were like three or four, maybe five roads that went out of LZ Baldy. And every morning they would have minesweepers go out and looking for mines on these roads. So if trucks were going down there, they didn't hit them. So are these, are these devices that are handheld looking for mines? Yes, they're moving the thing back and forth like you've seen in World War II movies or something. Uh -huh. Well, they put four of us on right side and four of us on the left side and had, had us to be out in like a V. We were out in front of them. And we had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> they didn't tell us about moving so slow. I guess if we thought about it, we would have known that. But anyway, we got out there and we just started walking. So after a while, we think, well, maybe we ought to go look at the road and see where they're at. There was nobody in sight. We walked away from it. <laughs> we were out there all by ourselves. <laughs> we thought, maybe we better backtrack a little bit. <laughs> well, did you have any armament with you? Did you have any uh, rifles or oh, pistols? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had M16s with us. <laughs> okay. Yeah. How heavy were these mine sweeping devices? How what? How heavy were they? The mine sweeping? I don't know. You got that? Yeah. The, the bottom of it, it had a plate about maybe that square, and you, then it was on a rod, and then they would, they would uh, sweep it back and forth, and they, they got earphones on there, and they're, they're listening for any metal detection that they got. So if they'd find them, then they'd have to stop and, and kind of de disarm them. Mm -hmm. So you did that for, what, about four days? Three or four days, yeah. Then, then they sent us out to our company. And our company was on the hill. There was a 105 howitzer there, but there were no bunkers there. Uh, there were just, uh, the, the, our company was just around the perimeter is all they were. I think they might have had some foxholes dug in there or something, but there were no bunkers. And it was just a temporary place. So we were only there for a couple days. I don't even remember if that 105 fired any while I was there. But uh, maybe by the time I got there, they were getting ready to pull out and helicopters were coming in each day and taking out the 105 howitzer rounds and then eventually the gun and then we left, got picked up by helicopters. Okay, and where'd you go from there? Just out in the field somewhere. <laughs> you know, we were just out moving around all every day we were moving, you know, and at night we'd set up a perimeter somewhere and stay there that night and the next day we'd move again. So is there any place on the map that uh, would be beneficial to show where 
some of the places you were, or were you always around Da Nang? No, we were we were up we were at LZ Baldy until about May, and really at that point there wasn't much going on. I mean, this was right after Tet supposedly, but I mean we'd be out once in a while. We might run into a VC or something, but almost nothing going on. And then it got to be about the beginning of May, and we were on a patrol one morning. We just started moving. The company commander got a radio call uh, from battalion saying, "Set up a perimeter. They're going to set. It, they're going to pick us up." So they did. They brought in. I don't know. There might be seven or eight or ten helicopters at a time come in and haul what they can, and they hauled us out to LZ West, which is further south, but it's out in the mountains. So you say uh, they told you to set up a perimeter. What? takes place while you're setting up a perimeter. What are you doing? We're just making a big circle and kind of securing the outside while these helicopters come in. Okay. So just so nobody attacks them, I guess, which nothing happened. All right. <clears throat> now, how many guys are in your in your unit at that time? Well, there's four platoons in a company, and the fourth platoon is a mortar platoon. So when I when I first got there around LZ Baldy, the, the mortars were with us for a while, but they weren't with us very much. They're usually sitting on a fire base somewhere where they can give us support if we need it. So they, there are usually three platoons. A platoon is supposed to be 40 men, but it usually wasn't. I mean, you were, at this time, we were probably closer to 40 than any, time, any other time I was there. Because once you start getting into stuff, you lose guys and you never had a 40-man 40, 40 platoon. Okay. So each squad was 10, 10 people. and <clears throat> So it, when we got ready to leave, uh, this first place, I, when I first joined the company, we got ready to leave. I was standing in front of our lieutenant, Lieutenant Spencer, and he's standing beside a guy with a radio on his back, and he's talking to him, and I'm standing right in front of him. I can hear what he's saying. He says, he says, you know, we need another radio operator. He pointed at me and said, you look like a radio operator. <laughs> so I had to take my brand new rucksack that I just brought from Fort Lewis off, do that radio on my back before those helicopters got there, and I became a radio <laughs> operator for seven and a half months, <laughs> which ended up getting me at the brigade talk at the end, so it did get me out of the field in the end. But <laughs> oh, good, good. So it paid off. <laughs> but you had absolutely no no training or anything as a radio operator. Well, in basic training, we had some stuff about phonetic alphabet and stuff like that. You know, I, I mean, you pick it up a lot quicker when you start doing it every day. But yeah. <laughs> but we did have some. I don't remember having any AIT, but in basic training, we did have some radio training on that. How heavy was the unit? About twenty-five pounds. And uh, are you carrying a weapon besides the radio? Oh yeah, I carried an M16. I carried 20 magazines, 20 round magazines. Where'd you carry them in? Where to carry the magazines? Where'd you, yeah, where'd you carry uh, them? In? Well, I had a I had a, a belt that had two pouches on each side. I could get uh, five in each one of those, and then I had an old Claymore mine bag that had been used as just an empty bag, and I put the other 10 in, well, probably nine in there, because the other one I had in the weapon. And how many shells were in each? Well, they, they're supposed to be 20, but we usually only put 18 in them, because sometimes if you put 20, they would jam. Okay. So we usually just put 18 in them. Uh, were you instructed that it might jam if you had it full, or did you learn that trial and error? Well, guys over there, I mean, they'd been there before I was, so they knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. We were learning from them. <clears throat> While you were sweeping mines, did you find any? I don't know. I don't remember that they did. Okay. But we may have been so far away from them. They found them and disarmed them. We didn't even know they did it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, did you go any other, other bases that we might show on the map or? Well, LZ West was out, out west of uh, Tam Key. So, so this would be, let's see, I can't see the map very well. Uh, it's probably on here. Let's see, Chulai's there. Da Nang. Well, Tam Key was kind of between Da Nang and Chulai, so it'd be in here somewhere. It's kind of a big town, but it's out in the mountains. It'd be out out in the mountains west here, quite a ways out west. Okay. So, so we were on we were on LZ West, and there were bunkers there. So, there, so somebody had been there before us, but the only people there at that time. Was the LERP team. Long range reconnaissance is what they were. There were like six or seven guys there. And they had trip flares all over the highest point of that hill. And our company commander was walking up to meet them and he was tripping all these flares. You know? oh. I mean, there were trip wires across there and he just tripped them. So we occupied all the bunkers and then they left. They got picked up by helicopters and left. Well, somebody that's going to be watching this uh, down the road, uh, what, what was a bunker constructed of? What did it look like? Well, they had. Uh, 
they had beams, there was the base of it, but then they had sandbags all around them and on top of them. I mean, they might have two or three layers of sandbags and stuff on them. Then they'd have a hole out the front or something where you could see out. And what was inside to sleep on? Ground. <laughs> uh, was there any, uh, any airflow? In, in this, or was it well, there totally was a, enclosed? There was there was a there was opening in the back, so you had a you had a hole in the front, and you had an opening in the back. So there was, but uh, yeah, you usually had uh, three or four people in each bunker, and then you had somebody awake all the time at night. Even when you're out in the field, when you weren't on a fire base like that, mm -hmm. you were still had three or four, usually three in a three in a each position and somebody took turn every hour you know somebody else was taking turn, taking their turn staying right. awake um how long were you there at lz west not very long because uh, that the i think that the first night we were there some 122 millimeter rockets were fired from west of us going over our heads now I assume they were heading heading for LZ Center, but I have no idea where they ever ended up because our battalion talk tactical operations center was on LZ Center, so we, our company had a bunker there too, and they had some guys for radio operators that could relay back to LZ Banet closer to July, and so I called them and I said, "Hey, some rockets are going over our head. You might want to get inside if you're not." You know? uh -huh. So where, where they ever ended up, I don't know. They weren't very accurate, so and they were so far away that chances of hitting anything they were aiming at probably wasn't very good. Uh, there at LZ West, what was your, how was your perimeter guarded? What, what did that consist of? Did you have wire around there, or uh, I, there, I think there was Constantina wire around it, and mm -hmm. there may have been. Claymore mines out there. I don't really remember what all was there, but of course they had these bunkers and then there was stuff out in front of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but we were, uh, well, I think about the, that night, well, they called helicopter gunships in to, to go fire at those rockets, but they didn't get there to daylight. By the time they got there, there was nobody around anymore, but they were down there firing rockets just for the fun of it, I guess. I, <laughs> I mean, at night, it looks like they're right here, but when daylight gets there, they're so far away from where we were that mm -hmm. you can't tell where they were. Mm -hmm. Even if they were still there, they probably wouldn't have been the right spot. But, <clears throat> but the next day, a couple helicopters got shot down uh, south of LZ Center. And uh, it came from Hill 352, which was south of LZ Center. And they had a 51 caliber machine gun set up there. Who did? In the North Vietnamese Army. Okay. So the... Uh, these helicopter they called helicopter gunships in there, and they knew that they were being fired at by something bigger than small arms. So they got out of there and called the Air Force in. And so we sat on LZ West, and this is, I don't know how many miles away, but we're sitting there watching these eight fighters in the air all day long. They came out of Da Nang, and they worked in twos, and they would they'd pound that hill. They pounded that hill all day long. As soon as one, one set got rid of their bombs and stuff, they left. Next group went in, another group came on station just circling, waiting their turn. And one of those fighters got shot down by that 51 caliber. Oh. So about a day later, they picked us up on LZ West and they, put, they dumped us out north of Hill 352 and we were going to Hill 352. And B Company, I don't know where they were coming from. We were C Company, they were B Company. They were coming from somewhere else and they got there before we did. And they went up the north side of that hill and they captured that 51 caliber. So when we followed them up maybe 20 minutes or 30 minutes later, <clears throat> everything was kind of quiet at that point. So they had kind of set up a perimeter on the, on the north side of the hill where we were coming up at. And then we got kind of behind them, not very far, pretty close to them and we were kind of digging in there and the next morning we were supposed to start moving towards on that hill seeing what's there but we no so sooner start moving and NVA were everywhere they were in spider holes they were still alive after all that bombing they went through in spider holes or what it just holes in the ground that these guys are down in is what keeps them alive if the bomb doesn't hit the hill they're probably going to survive it and boy they did a lot of them did and so there were 17 of us wounded and two killed and two got two guys got left behind that they didn't get back till a few days later so uh what time of day did, uh, did the enemy make their appearance? Well, as soon as we started moving, this was early in the morning. Was it daylight? Oh yeah, it was daylight, yeah. We just started moving towards them and they started firing. 
and I could see a machine gun over here firing and, and they were inspired. We had guys walking right up in their holes and shooting them in their holes. Our platoon sergeant was a, a Hispanic guy and he was a good platoon sergeant and he always wore his steel pot real tight and he actually had a round by a guy in one of these holes shoot at him and went in his helmet and out the other side and it flipped him around and he didn't get hurt but then he got wounded later. Oh, wow. <laughs> So that's pretty close. <laughs> but I got a piece of shrapnel in my knee almost right, right away, and I'm, I'm just laying, laying there on the ground, just still talking on the radio, you know. <laughs> but it, this didn't last very long, and then they came back, and then they called three, dust off came in three different times and took us out of there, and then the rest of them walked off the hill like the next day, probably. Well, did these spider holes have covers on them? I don't know. At that time, I'm sure they didn't. Mm -hmm. Because they were they were out of them shooting at them out of them. Yeah, but, but they uh, might have had some camouflage on them to start with. Yeah, I, I would think they would have some kind of protection from the from the rockets and what was being thrown at them. Well, just being in the being underground like that, you know, even these big bombs are dropping on them. If it doesn't hit in a hole, yeah. you know, it might ring their ring their bell a little bit. But <laughs> It didn't so kill how, how, how did you get uh, hurt? I just got a piece of shrapnel in my right knee. From almost what? Immediate, uh, probably a, either a mortar, or grenade. I don't know what it was from. What were you doing at the time? I was just moving with everybody else, moving towards them. You walking? Yeah, walking. Yeah. And what did it feel like? Um, didn't really hurt much. It just just something hit my knee, and I kind of fell down, and, and I had a hole in my knee, and. Didn't hurt that bad. I mean, I was able to walk walk back, you know, to get back a little ways from there after everybody started coming back. But uh, I got on the third dust off then that came back and got out of there. <laughs> well, when you talk about a dust off, you're talking about the helicopters are coming in. Right. What what kind of helicopters were they? They were Hueys. Yeah. And they really couldn't land on top of the hill. They were kind of. I'm not sure they really actually set all the way down because they were kind of landing on the north side and they might have just been hovering with maybe the front was on the ground or something but uh, I wasn't wounded I mean some guys were wounded worse than I was so I didn't get on to the last one and I'm glad to get out of there so we went to LZ Baldy at an aid station at that point mm -hmm. so uh, did you have 120 guys up there or was that 80 uh, well, if it, it was three, well, we had two companies, so it'd been if we had a full platoon, it would have been 120 of each company. But we probably didn't. We probably weren't at full strength. And and you had uh, how many killed? Two killed. Two, two killed. How there were only two killed? I have no idea. Yeah. It seemed like there ought to have been a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. Now, after an action like that, did anybody from from the military? I don't care what branch, check how many enemy dead there were. Because, you know, back home you read about the number right. of killed and all yeah. that stuff, trying to justify that we're killing more of them than they are of us. But right. Was anybody doing that? Uh, well, I don't, know. I don't know how you do that. I mean, they were still there. They weren't all dead. You know, they were still there when we left. So, I mean, I, after I got out of the hospital, I, I was in an aid station over, I had to shrapnel. They tried to take it out, but they couldn't find it. They made another hole and they, they said it was against the bone. They said someday it'll work its way out. Well, it did. It was taken out, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago when I was having a shoulder surgery. They just went down and it did, you could feel it. You could roll your finger on it and feel it. And they just, he just made a little cut with a scalpel and he said it popped right out. It was just about the size of a BB. It wasn't that much. Okay. I was lucky. I mean, it could have been a lot worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I'm sure somebody probably made an estimated guess, but that's probably all it was. I'm sure they weren't going around having them hold their hands up. And <laughs> Are you dead? No. I'm not. <laughs> there had to be quite a few killed just from the airstrikes, I would think. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, they were pretty good about dragging bodies off, too, and you'd never see them. Oh, okay. Um, all right. So you're there, you, you get taken out by the helicopters back to... The main base? Well, LZ Baldy first. There was an aid station there. I stayed there overnight. Then the next morning, some of us flew back to July to the, the main hospital, sir. Okay. And were you there for a while? I was there for five days. And where, what kind of facility were you in? Did it was have, just... Uh, did they have a, a hospital building or was there a tent hospital or what? It was, it was more of a... I don't know if it was really a tent hospital, but it was more like a tent hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, it had a metal roof on it and had some frame, probably had sandbags around it. Uh, Male nurses, female nurses, what? Uh, 
probably maybe both. I don't really remember too much about it, but probably both. There was a girl from Ohio by the name of Sharon Lane that was killed over there in a rocket attack. Mm. She was one of only about five women that were killed in Vietnam from oh. a hostile action, and oh. a rocket hit that hospital and killed her. Oh, shoot. If you ever Google Sharon Lane, you'll see all about her. Uh -huh. but she was from northeastern Ohio. <clears throat> so, uh, were you mobile at that time? Could you walk around while you were there at the hospital? I think so. I don't remember really having crutches or anything. Did, so. you, did you eat in the chow hall, in the mess hall? I don't remember there. I don't remember if they brought food to us or whether we went somewhere. Well, while you were, while you were over there in Vietnam, uh, were you having Vietnamese cooks or American cooks or what? <laughs> sea rations. Sea rations. Yeah. Sea rations from World War II? Some of them, I think, were. Yeah. Yeah. We, we were in the field most of the time. Very seldom. I mean, if we got back to a fire base for a few days, usually if we got back, they put us on the bunker line so everybody else could take a break, I guess. Uh -huh. That was our break, being on the bunker line of a fire base. But it was, it was a lot better being out where we were, so. <laughs> so, uh, how about, you know, you're out there in the field, how often would you get a change of clothes? Oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe once a month, I don't know. <laughs> Wasn't very often. And We all smelled the same. Yeah. <laughs> How about the uh, how about the enemy? Could, did they sm could, did you ever get close enough to smell them? What they smelled like? I don't know. I don't I, I don't remember that. All right. Um, they probably smelled like us too. <laughs> were, were you in any locations where uh, where the VC or, or the uh, North Vietnamese uh, attacked at night? No, I never was. Okay. Of course, usually they were attacking fire bases or landing zones, and we weren't normally on them. Okay. So, how often would you get your sea rations replenished if you're out there in the boondocks? Well, usually we got resupplied every day. Usually, when we got to a place, they called it a night logger, where we we're going to stay for the night, we'd set up a perimeter. Usually, helicopters would come out, and they would... Uh, bring out water cans and sea rations and stuff like that. And then the next morning before we left, they would come back and pick up the empty water cans. Okay. So most of the time, pretty much every day, not always. Uh, one time they were sending us back in the bushes and we were gonna be moving at night and hiding out at the day and trying to find them. And so they gave us what they called lurp rations. They were just dehydrated food in bags, which was, they had chili and they had some different things that we weren't used to eating. So it tasted kind of good, but you had to have water too. Yeah. You know? yeah. So we had to water what we carried and that's all the water we had. So we did that for a couple of days and then we were getting ready to move another night and they got a radio call that they got a, some intelligence. There was a large, large enemy force moving up that valley where we were going towards them. And they told us to get out of there. So we started going the other way. And then the next morning, helicopters picked us up and took us out of there. Okay. Um, geez. Uh, <laughs> did, did you ever... Uh, did you ever have uh, contact with the enemy where you used your M16? few times but usually I only fired at M16 four times when I was there because usually when we got into something I was on the radio talking to somebody mm -hmm. so I <laughs> one time we got ambushed and our platoon was in the in the rear and we were kind of going through a little valley and they had they had some holes dug in the side of the hill and the guy that was on point who was just kind of a new guy he got shot and he ended up dying there but our platoon was in the rear so our platoon sergeant had us go up the hill on the other side and we got up higher than what they were over here and we were shooting them down well then he comes up and gets about i don't know six of us maybe and there was a there was a, a, a an area behind us where there was some some nva in a hole and they spotted him so they didn't know exactly where they were so he had us line up walking towards them firing our weapon of course, I always talk, told you if you walked into an ambush, turn and assault the ambush. Well, that was a bunch of baloney. We got out of there as quick as we could. <laughs> but that's kind of what we were doing, not knowing where they were. We were just kind of walking towards them, kind of firing. And we got up there, and uh, one guy was in a hole with an M40 or AK-47 just hanging out, firing into the ground. And somebody dropped a grenade in the hole, and that, that ended that. Mm -hmm. 
So they weren't even, I mean, at that point, they were just staying low because they were being fired at. And yeah. So he was just shooting that MF, or AK-47 into the ground right in front of him. Um, uh, what was your rank when you, when you got over to Vietnam? I was a, a PFC, E3. Did you get any uh, change in grade? Yeah, I was promoted to a spec four. When? Uh, probably not real long after I was there. A lot of people in the infantry were coming and going, so they had a lot of, lot of places to fill. You know, a lot okay. of ways to fill. So you could you could make rank pretty quick. So I was a spec four. Uh, like I say, after seven and a half months, we'd been up in the mountains, and. Um, We'd, we'd walked into some ambush. We had a lot of guys killed up in there. And one day our company from LZ Bayonet called us. We were back around July at this point. And I could, I could talk to a company at LZ Bayonet. And they called me on the radio and said, hey, the Brigade Talk is looking for radio operators to replace guys going home. You got any interest? And I said, heck yes, get me out of here. We're still up in the mountains at this point, you know. So a few days later, then I ended up at LZ Bayonet for the rest of my four and a half months. Okay. So, so that was a lot better. I mean, I was working 12-hour days, but that was fine. But while I was back there, I went in as a Spec 4, which a radio operator in Brigade Talk, that's what a Spec 4 did, you know. Well, then my company promoted me to an E5 not long ago. Well, it was November. I got there in September. Two months later, my company promoted me to an E5. So the brigade commander, Colonel Thomas, and the command sergeant major, I don't remember his name, they called me up to his office, and they started telling me, hey, you're an E5, you can't be a radio operator anymore. You're gonna to have to go back to your company, go back to the field. I thought, oh, crap. <laughs> well, it turned out they were pulling my leg. Oh. Thank goodness, because I was ready to go back to being a spec four. <laughs> I didn't wanna go back to the field. Well, they ended up, they gave me another guy and they put us in the, in the back room where an Air Force guy had, had a bunch of radio equipment. And they had, we had a direct connection to the artillery unit, which was down the, down the hill from where we were. So what happened, helicopters, if they were flying somewhere, they would call us and they wanted to know where artillery was being fired from and what azimuth, so they didn't fly into it. Mm -hmm. So if they would call us, then we'd just pick up the mic, which we had a hot mic directly to them, and just ask them if they had anything, you know, firing out of this LZ or that LZ, and if so, what azimuth and stuff, and they mm -hmm. would tell us, and then we'd just radio the helicopters. So we were, just two of us were doing that, so we were working 12-hour days, and big deal. We were sleeping in a hooch at night, and in a cot, and you know, air mattress, and mosquito netting and it was a lot different than it was on the field. <laughs> yeah, none of that so stuff. So the, the hooch is different than your other accommodation? Well, it's just a... It's a bunker. Oh yeah, it's not a bunker. It's uh, it's just a building. It's got wood frame and it's, it maybe had a tent over the top. These had metal roofs on them, I think. And they had screening in the sides and they had sandbags up the side that went okay. up so high above where the cots would have been. And you were there four and a half months? Four and a half months. Now, while, while you were there, how was the food there? Was it, it you weren't, you, you're at a base, so you're not eating sea rations, right, are you? Right, right, yeah, they, they had the mess food? halls. Uh, it was okay. At night, artillery had a mess hall just down the hill, and a lot of times at night, we go down there and eat serve food down there at night. Um, so you're working 12-hour days. Uh, did you do anything else besides work and sleep? Not much. <laughs> uh -huh. Didn't do much else. I mean, while you were there, did any USO companies come over for entertainment? Well, uh, in December of '67 or '68, December '68, Bob Hope was actually in July, and I could have gone to that, but I only had another month and a little over a month to go to. I was going home, and so this other guy was a E3 or a E4. I forget what he was. I said, "Why don't you go ahead and go? I'll just work the shift." And so he went. So I didn't uh -huh. go. I watched it when I got home. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, uh, who's taking care of your hooch? Who's cleaning out and changing your bed and doing all that stuff? Well, all we had was an air mattress and a sleeping bag, and uh, I mean, there wasn't much to do. I don't remember anybody really cleaning it. I mean, some people, I hear people talk about hooch girls and stuff that come yeah. in, you know, and I don't remember anybody doing that there. There were probably like eight of us in that building, you know, sleeping. Okay. So, I mean, it's just a wood floor. It wasn't anything real clean anyway, so. <laughs> uh, tell me about the weather in the daytime. Was it hot and cool at night, or how did that vary? I don't remember. Well, 
I guess it depends where you were and what time of the year it was. And I don't remember when the monsoon was, but whenever the monsoon season was, I mean, we were in the field, you were wet all the time. Yeah. I mean, you, you were like a prune all the time because you just couldn't get out of it. Uh, when we were up in the mountains sometimes, it was cold. I mean, we had no field jackets or anything like that. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know what the temperature was. It might have been in the 60s, I don't know, but it was really when you're wet and cold, you know, it was pretty cold up there. Uh -huh. But it, like I say, it might have been in the 60s. I mean, that was cold compared to 95 to 100 or something. You know? Well, could you do anything about building a fire at night to warm yourself up or anything? No, not when you're in the field. That, that, was, <laughs> that was verboten because the enemy is going to be. Oh, yeah. Uh, you may be drawing some, some bad fire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, while, you, while you were there uh, that last four and a half months, did you? Did any of the enemy try to infiltrate the, the camp? They did one time. They actually got in there one night. They got some, some guys got in with satchel charges and they were throwing them in hooches and stuff. Mm. I didn't see any of it. I don't know if where I was at that time. I don't know if I, if I was in where I was sleeping in a different part or whether I was in a brigade talk at that time. Uh, but they did throw some satchel charges into some hooches and blew them up. I don't remember if anybody got hurt or not. Well, but they got through the wire, you know, they come through there at night and... Well, what kind of protection did you have on the perimeter at that base? Well, they had a lot of Constantina wire around it. I'm sure they had claymores out there, they had trip flares out there, they had bunkers all the way around it where guys were in there. You know, and these, these uh, VC would just maybe get through that wire without being detected and... <laughs> How, how close were the were the hooches or or whatever lookouts they had on the perimeter? Well, they were out of ways from where the where all of us were standing, where the brigade talk was. Mm -hmm. They were out away from it. There was a hill there on the on the west side, and bunkers were up on that hill too. So <clears throat> our hooches weren't up on the hill; they were down down below, more on the co not on the coastline. We were pretty far from the beach. So how did you find out about them throwing satchels in the hooches? Did was that conversation? later that day or did you did you hear it going on or what oh, i'm sure i heard it going on i mean it would have been loud but i don't know if i knew what it was at the time mm -hmm. and i think some of those zoned in i think they got killed too mm -hmm. but i don't know if any americans were killed or not or wounded so i did go on r, &R while i was in the rear uh, in October, I met Joyce in Hawaii. So. In Hawaii? <laughs> yeah. How long did you have there? A week? Six days. <laughs> Six days? How'd yeah. you get there on a military or commercial? Oh, that was, that was commercial. Uh, we went to the day, and a guy that I met there, he worked in the photo lab for the 190th Brigade. And he'd been there the whole time, I think. And we went together, and his wife went there too. She was from West, or they were from West Virginia. So we went to Da Nang, we flew C-130s up to Da Nang, stayed all night there. And then the next morning we flew commercial out of Da Nang to Hawaii. We stopped in Guam and I don't remember where else we stopped on the way there. But on the way home, we stopped in Guam and I was sitting there, we, we disembarked the plane and we were sitting in the terminal. And I look up and here's a guy from Sydney that I knew walking through there. He was stationed there in the Air Force. Mike Bunker was his name. <laughs> I just talked to him about it the Memorial Day Service Monday. <laughs> so small, small world, world sometimes. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. So how long were you actually over in Hawaii with, uh, with your wife? Just six days. Yeah. I got there a little bit before she did. And then so where did you stay there? Uh, we had an apartment there we rented. Okay. Didn't have to stay on a military base. No. No. Good. Uh, why were, uh, on these commercial flights, were there any civilians flying back and forth on these flights? I or was it know. all military? I would guess probably most military. I don't know if there were any civilians or not. What kind of planes were you flying in uh, commercial? They were like Boeing 707s or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you, you do R and R with with your wife, and then you get back to uh, Vietnam. So uh, what'd you do then? You still in the same company? Still the same group? Doing the same? Still, still working radio operating? Still working at the brigade talk. Yeah, I finished my tour there. And 
How did you know your tour was up? Were you counting the days or did oh, somebody yeah. tell you? <laughs> I was counting my days. Everybody had short time on their calendars. <laughs> you knew what day you left. You know, uh -huh. February 5th is when I left Fort Lewis and February 4th is when I was leaving there, so. Okay. <laughs> uh, what did you have to do before you were able to get on the plane to leave? What did I have to do? Well, we went to Cameron Bay. We flew probably C-130s out of July down to Cameron Bay and then we stayed there all night. And then the next next morning, then we got a commercial flight out of there, and then, however, we went back. I don't remember, I don't remember where we stopped going home. We didn't go through Japan. I know that. How much of military gear did you have to turn all that in? Uh, well, I had my duffel bag and all that, but like rifles and stuff like that. Yeah, all that you stuff. You weren't able to there. bring back any no treasures, pistols, or anything like no, that. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, when you, when you came back, uh, were you in civilian clothes or uniform? Probably khaki, khakis, I think. All right, where, and where did you land when you came back to the States? Uh, McCord Air Force Base. Where is that? Fort Lewis, Washington. Oh, okay. they're, they're side by side, now they call them joint base, but they were side by side then. Okay. So that's where we flew out of too when we went over, so we landed there. People that were getting out of the army at that point, then they had to, they had to stay there for a few days because they had to process out. But I wasn't getting out of the army. I was actually reassigned to Fort Lewis, so I had to come home and then drive back out. <laughs> okay. For I had, after I got out there, I had five and a half months left after a thirty day leave. Okay. So we went out there together and stayed out there. Uh huh. Where'd you live out there before you uh, actually got Lakewood. It's a little suburb of Tacoma. It's about five miles north of Fort Lewis. An apartment or a house? It was an apartment, yeah. Everybody in that complex was military except two. They were either Air Force or Army. Mm -hmm. So we got to meet a lot of, made a lot of friends out there and did a lot of stuff together. And So okay. I could have extended in Vietnam for 45 days and got out when I got back. Because if you came back and had less than five months, they just said, it's not worth messing with you, we'll let you out. And I thought about it, because I felt pretty good there. You know? But a friend of mine from Troy did extend, and he ended up getting out later than he would have probably, because they got mortared one night, and he fell into a bunker and broke his leg. Oh. And he ended up having to be in a military hospital for a while. So. Oh, shoot. <laughs> and, and no matter... No matter how far you were away from the real action, there's always a chance that oh, yeah. something's going to happen. So well, like that nurse, <laughs> you, you know. You, you want to get out. You want to get out of there as soon as you could. Yeah, probably so. <laughs> it was a good decision, I think. <laughs> so you had you had a car out there in, in Tacoma, mm -hmm. and uh, so then when you do finally get out, you come back to Sydney. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Went back to work at ODOT survey crew. Okay. <laughs> Where I stayed for 34 years. <laughs> how, how long was it from the time you actually got back to town before you went back to work? Probably a few days. I don't know. It wasn't mm. long. Probably whatever the next Monday was, <laughs> I went back. So were your parents still living when you came back home? Yes. And what was that reunion like? <laughs> I don't know. I guess getting home from Vietnam was more important than getting home from Fort Lewis. <laughs> of course, then it had only been like five and a half months since I'd seen them. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, you're, you're married. You're back here in Sydney. You're working for ODOT, working out of the Sydney division. Mm -hmm. um, and you're doing what for them? Well, I was on, on a survey crew. I was in, an instrument man for quite a few years. And then in 19... I think 78, the guy that was the head of the survey department came out and talked to me one day and he said, the design office is looking for somebody to go inside and help do right, help develop right away plans and wondered if I had any interest. And I said, yeah, I think I'd like to do that. So I did and I went in. Of course, at this point, they had no PCs or anything. Uh, the guy that was head of the survey department, uh, they, used, they had a coordinate geometry program that was on a mainframe, which you had to code it on an 80-column 80, 80 sheet and give it to some person to enter it in, and it might be hours until you get it back. You know, that was kind of a pain, but it was a way to do it. It was a way to do all your calculations and everything, and then all your plans were done by hand at that time. So I did that for quite a while, and then I ended up starting to work. We started getting into electronic stuff in the survey department. So we started getting PCs in the office and started to learn how to do that, and the survey crews were starting to get 
more modern equipment, uh, total station, stuff like that. Well, now you got a data collector, you got to download it. How do we do this, you know? Well, they didn't have any any computers in their office, so I got involved with a with a, uh, a, a computer program called uh, CLM System. Well, CLM Systems was a company. Uh, the uh, let's see what was it? What was the? It was it was a coordinate geometry program. They called it Kogo. The guy that owned the company in Florida was Professor Charlie Miller. He worked at MIT, and he's con considered the father of Kogo. He developed this with a bunch of students at MIT, and this mainframe was actually his program. Well, he went on his own, and he started developing this stuff for PCs. So there were three of us, uh, one from District 11 and one from Central Office that was using this mainframe program. So they sent the three of us to Florida to learn how to use this on a PC, and then they gave us a PC to use it on. So it started going from there, started learning how to do different things, and then started learning how to download data collectors. I was doing all this for the survey department because they had none. So eventually I ended up getting a surveyor's license. So when uh, a guy retired from there, I applied for that position and got that. And then we started getting everybody in the survey department learning how to use computers and all this stuff so they could kind of do it on their own and process their own data and all this stuff. Well, so, uh -huh. so the last seven years, that's what I did. I was in the survey department. So that, that made stuff more accurate and quicker? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, when did you and Joy start having uh, children? 1972. And your first child? Was a son, David. All right. And uh, how old's David now? Well, he was so born in 72, 72, so 52, 52, I guess. He just had a birthday, 52. And what does David do? He works for Parker Stores. They make hydraulic hoses. Okay. Hy hydraulic hoses for different companies. Is he married? Yes. Have children? Got four boys. Four boys. And where do they live? Around here? Uh, yeah, they're all around here. Two of them, three of them, well, two of them are in college. The youngest one just graduated from high school this year. Okay. So he's going to UC next year. Uh, where are the boys in school? Where are the other ones in college? The ones at UC and the other ones at Miami. And the other one's 32, so he's got three, we got three great grandkids. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, what's David's wife's name? Katie. She work outside the home? She's a teacher in Troy. Okay. And you have another child? A Lori. She was born in 75. She's in Columbus. She's an insurance agent. <laughs> okay. uh, home, life, auto, what? Fire and casualty, yeah. Okay. Not, not life. I don't think she does. She's mainly working on the commercial side. She worked for an agency in Columbus, and she mainly uh, services the commercial side. Uh, what's her maiden, what's her married name? Snyder. S N Y D E R. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they got uh, two kids. What, what's her husband do? He's a respiratory therapist. He runs a company. They service nursing homes, and he's the Ohio director, I guess, for the company. It's out of uh, up in Michigan. Uh, I forget what the name of the town is, but he's kind of the, their head guy here in, in Ohio. Okay. So he's run ragged. <laughs> and, and you mentioned they had how many children? They have two. They have a boy, Will, who just graduated uh, last weekend, and then they got a daughter that's a freshman. In high school? Yes. Mm -hmm. So she plays soccer, and uh, he, he wrestles, he plays rugby, which not through the school, and he, he played football. Okay. Well, before we totally leave your, your military, uh, I'm looking at a list of medals you got. You got a Purple Heart. Yes. You got a Bronze Star with a V device. Yes. Uh, you were designated you were in Vietnam. Well, say that what's, again? what's the V? Vietnam? Valor. Valor, okay. Yeah. A lot of space officers, they got, they got Bronze Stars, but they, they weren't with a V. They just for whatever, as mostly officers, I think, got those. And you got a combat infantry badge? Yes. Let me, let me take you back to, uh, to Vietnam. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> you're, 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 you're at LZ Bowman, and uh, by the end of June, uh, 
You only had about 35 guys left out of your uh, unit? That were either, yeah, that weren't either wounded. Most of them were wounded, were in the hospital or something. Because uh -huh. we'd been, well, in May is when we were out at LZ Center, which is where all this, three, Hill 352 and all this happened. Yeah. So we lost a lot of guys there, wounded, mostly wounded, some killed. And then they took us out of there and they, they sent us to LZ Bowman. Well, that's where we walked into this ambush. Yeah. And then we got mortared a week later coming through kind of the same area and we lost some guys there. And uh, we just had a lot of guys wounded and we just down to, we weren't uh, a full operating unit anymore. So they put us out on a, an island across from uh, Chulai. They took us out there on a, a little boat and the Marines on the end of it had a surface air missile base. And I don't think they ever probably fired them. Uh -huh. But they just put us out there to kind of recoup. And at night, they'd supposedly send us out on ambushes. And we'd just go outside the perimeter a little bit and crawl back in there and just do nothing. <laughs> uh, you spent time in lowlands called Rocket Pocket? Rocket Pocket. That's around Chulai. Well, 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 how did you get that name? Well. Uh, they called the mountains west of Chulai. They used to fire these 122 millimeter rockets into Chulai, and that's where this uh, nurse got killed from one of those rockets. So they called the mountains Rocket Ridge, and then the valley below it, they called it the Rocket Pocket. Okay. So that's just a name that they gave it. Now, I, I don't want to embarrass you, but I'm going to read about your uh, Brown Star. Uh, the reason you got this was, and I'm quoting, for heroism in connection with military operations against a hostile force in the Republic of Vietnam. Specialist Ford <laughs> Deem distinguished himself by valorous action on 1 September 1968 while serving as a radio and telephone <clears throat> operator with Company C, 1st Battalion, 6th Infantry, 198th Infantry Brigade. On that date, the company was engaged in a combat operation near the village of Phuc Ben Thé uh, when it made contact with an enemy force of undetermined size. Employing heavy machine guns and automatic weapons, the insurgents uh, inflicted heavy casualties on the company, <coughs> scattering the uh, squads throughout the area. Undaunted, Specialist Deem contacted the various squad leaders and guided them back into the perimeter. He diligently maintained contact with the company commander and the battalion commander during the ensuing firefight, <clears throat> leaving his platoon sergeant free to supervise his men. After arranging a common landing zone to ensure the speedy evacuation of the wounded, he took the initiative to call in artillery on the hostile positions. Repeatedly exposed himself to the heavy enemy fire to ensure accurate adjustment of the artillery fire. During the same period, he also called in supporting gunships and adjusted their fire on the enemy. When the firefight subsided, he directed medical aircraft to the company's location. His, ti his timely actions contributed greatly to the success, success of the mission and the subsequent defeat of the enemy. Specialist for Deem's personal heroism, professional competence, <clears throat> and devotion to duty are in keeping with the highest traditions of the military service services and reflect great credit upon himself, the American Division, the United States Army. Now, uh, how were you doing all this? How were you directing the, the <laughs> artillery fire? I'm not sure I was. I don't remember any of this. <laughs> The guy that put me in for this, his name was John Beasley. He was a major. He was like the battalion S2 or S3. And he was, he was in the battalion talk on Hill 76, which is down in the rocket pocket. We're up in the mountains. So he, I get back, we get back down there like the next day or something. And he comes running up there. He's looking for me. I was like, oh, crap. What did I do now, you know? And he tells me he's going to put me in for a silver star. I thought, for what, you know? And I don't, I think whoever writes us up, writes them up pretty good. So I, I don't know. I don't remember all that stuff. You had to do something to get that. Yeah, it must have been something. <laughs> I must have been so busy. I don't remember it. I don't know. Uh -huh. I'm not sure I did all that. <laughs> well, I also note that you're in the Ohio Military Hall of Fame for Valor. Tell me about that. Well, I knew nothing about that until a year ago this past February. Uh, 
guy by the name of Scott Stewart, who's been involved with the Shelby County Vets to D.C. and the, when the Vietnam Wall was here, he was a powerlifting coach, I think at Riverside High School, and he had his team come over and pound all these thousand rebars in the baseball field, the Legion field down here, where they put all these flags on there. And so he got involved in this, and he got involved in his Vets to D.C. trip, and then when Shelby County ran out of veterans to take, because they'd take, I think, two trips a year, and they'd take two buses each time, and it was, it was down one day, tour the next day and home the next day. So it was a three day thing. So he's, him and his wife started, started this up in Logan County afterwards. So he calls me in February a year ago and says, hey, he's got a, a, another trip going, last trip probably, and they've got some room. He wanted to know if I'd be interested in going again, you know, going with them. And I said, well, not really. I don't really know anything. I w wouldn't know any of those people over there or anything, and I've already been there. So then he starts telling me about this, this Hall of Fame for Valor. I said, what's that? I never heard of it. And he said, well, you have, he said you had to have a bronze star with V or higher to be inducted. In reality, it's a Army Commendation Medal with V, which I didn't know there was one, or higher. So I said, oh, I got one of those. He said, really? He said, send me your stuff. Well, I already had everything <laughs> scanned, so I emailed it to him. And two days later, he calls and said, you're going to be inducted this May. <laughs> So we went over and there were like, I forget, 20, I think there were like 27 of us maybe inducted. Mm -hmm. Another guy from Shelby County too, who's a Navy SEAL, who's got all kind of medals. So this year, a guy I graduated with, I put him in last year after this happened because I found out he had three bronze stars with V's. Oh. So his wife brought all his orders down here and I scanned everything and I sent it in and he got inducted this year. Oh, super. And next year, hopefully there's going to be another guy that's got an Army Combination Medal with V, which I didn't know until we were at this induction this year. Uh -huh. So super. I'll work on getting him in there too. So it was nice. It was a nice ceremony. It was at the State House in the atrium and I forgot to mention that my wife Mary is our camera person today and uh, <laughs> she always uh, enjoys talking to you uh, Vietnam veterans. Mary do you have any questions or anything come to mind? I just finished reading a novel um, about Vietnam nurses mm -hmm. all the women and so I am just full of everything. When you when you talk about a hooch, was it a wooden building or did did they have any like just those quanta halfway? Well, it's more like a, a wood frame building yeah. and the bottom of it, I mean, it was all covered with sandbags. So I'm not sure, it's probably some kind of wood behind. Maybe there was yeah. nothing but a frame. I don't really know. Yeah. But inside there was some like paneling or something in there that you know separated from the sandbags. But then the, it was the top from halfway up to the to the roof maybe was screen, mm -hmm. and then it usually had metal roofing on the top of it. I I cannot imagine being in a place that wet and drippy, all the mold and critters that would just be <laughs> everywhere. I love my bugs. I don't want, you know, too close. Um, there was one other, and I can't remember, oh, azimuth or azimuth? Azimuth. Azimuth. Okay, I can spell that, but I can't say it. Thank you for saying it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've seen that word. Just azimuth. a direction of, uh, direction. on 360 degree. Uh, yeah. 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 Tell me about the wildlife there, uh, not the nightlife, but the critters. Uh, were, there, were there lions, tigers, snakes, rats? What the, what the heck? Yes, yes. I don't know about lions. Uh, the only time I ever knew anything about a tiger is our battalion commander was real close to us in his helicopter. He had a command helicopter he'd always fly around in. <coughs> so he was trying to shoot a tiger from the helicopter that was pretty close to us, but I never saw the tiger. <laughs> but he saw it from the air. I never saw elephants. Supposedly there were elephants there. We had reports at the time where elephants were moving here to there. I saw two snakes I was there. One of them was in an old punji pit that had been long abandoned. It was down in a hole. And somebody said it was a cobra. I don't know if it was a cobra. The only other snake I saw was slithering through a rice paddy. It looked like a, well, I don't know if they have garter snakes over there, but that's what it looked like to me was a garter snake. Leeches, they had leeches, 
land, they had big leeches in the water or they had the little white leeches, leeches that were in the grass and they'd get on you and they, you wouldn't even know and you'd be bleeding and we had one guy had gotten his groin area and had to call the dust off because he couldn't get the bleeding stopped. Hmm. So they were kind of nasty. Well, you mentioned a uh, punji pit. Now, are you moving at nighttime? Usually not. Sometimes we did. At one point, <clears throat> well, when we were in this rocket pocket around July, <clears throat> somebody came up with a bright idea to have all the companies move at night and not during the day. So they supposedly had it planned out that none of us would cross each other's path. Because when we were moving, I mean, VC and NVA, if, it was, if there was a moon out, they were usually didn't, weren't out at night. They weren't moving around because you could see them. But when it was dark, when there was no moon, that's when they were moving. So we were out one night. We were coming out uh, below Hill 270. And we had our, the guy who was my platoon commander came back out to the field because he was, he was a ranking officer and we didn't have any, any company commander. So he came back out after being in the rear for a number of months as the XO. So we're moving, I'm, I'm his RTO in the front, front of the company. And we get out the end of a, end of a, a hedge road that's sticking out in Wright's Paddy. And he says, let's just everybody just sit down and just take a break right here. So everybody sits down behind this hedge row. Our point man's got a starlight scope on his M16, which these things are like this long night vision things, but they're real big, you know, and heavy. So he starts looking out across that Wright's Paddy and almost immediately he sees somebody coming at us. And he doesn't know if it's one of our companies or if it's bad guys. And we don't want to ambush our own company or one of our other companies. Yeah. So the company commander gets the radio and he's trying to call a battalion to try to confirm where they're at. And these guys walk right on the other side of the hedgerow from us. And I mean, they're from, they're closer than me to you, more like me to you on the other side of the board, but down behind this hedgerow, you know, that's that, that high. And they walk on the other side and they heard him talking. And I, one of them was right on the other side of the hedgerow from me, and he turned and kind of pointed, and they started yapping Vietnamese. Well, that wasn't one of our guys. <laughs> I never even carried it around in my, my M16, but boy, I pulled that thing back and took it off safety all at once. That was one of the four times I fired that rifle. And we didn't know, the point man didn't know how many there were. I mean, we had no idea. So we got out in the rice paddy inside the dike and just kind of set up a perimeter until it got light. Mm -hmm. We kept hearing somebody moaning, you know, and then we, when it got light, we started moving up and there was one VC girl there laying there had been shot. And she had a chai, chai com grenade, Chinese communist grenade on her, you know. And, oh, really? But there, there had to be other people that were shot and just were either drug off or weren't, weren't, were just wounded and not killed or something. But So she's the one that had been shot sometime that night? And, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, well, how old was she? Just a youngster? Oh, uh, well, I don't know how she was. I don't know if I even got a good look at her. Not really real old, mm -hmm. you know, maybe in her 20s. I don't know. Not real old. Well, so. What was the difference in the dress between the NVA and, and the VC? Well, NVA had uniforms. They have uh, olive drab uniforms and they had a pit helmet, you know, they wear. And uh, VC, a lot of times, with black pajamas or just whatever they wore. You mm -hmm. know? <clears throat> Did you ever take any prisoners? I don't think so. Well, I think. So. I think maybe there were some in, that were sent back, but a lot of times they'd send them back to the rear to be interviewed and stuff. Before you know it, they were right back out there and you thought, gee, many Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> they got to be VC, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, if Mary, Mary, can you uh, I mean, fo I? focus in on this machine gun, which is... Oh, that's that 51 caliber on Hill 352 that was captured, that shot down a fighter. Yep. Got it? Yep. Okay. So that's the one that was captured that was shooting at you. Yeah, B Company capture, captured that before we got there. Because when we were coming up there, we could hear that thing. I mean, there were rounds in our direction. And you can, you know, when you walk into an ambush, you don't really, you don't really know where it came from. Because you don't hear the, the sound of the bullet exploding. You hear the sound of the round breaking the sound barriers that's going by you. Oh. So you never knew what direction it was coming from, okay. unless you see smoke or something, you know, from the from the round going off. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but uh, you you don't you don't know. You just hear that that round, you know, breaking the sound barrier, cracking, and real loud cracks. And we could hear that 51 caliber. I mean, those were loud cracks, <laughs> and they were just kind of generally in our. I mean, we were on the other side of trees and everything else, so they weren't aiming at us. They were just going in that direction. Thinking back on it, what is the what is the one thing, if you can even pinpoint one thing, that uh, stands out most in your mind while you were over there in Vietnam? Any instance where you almost were shot, or when you got your your wound, or uh, seeing somebody else shot, or well, Hill three fifty two. That was probably the first major thing that that we ran into because the first. You know, from the time I got there until then, just not much was going on at all. I mean, we we didn't even build little tents out of two ponchos and get bamboo and chop and build tents. I look at those pictures now and I think, how the heck did we ever do that? I mean, we were never anywhere after that that we ever felt secure enough to do that. Uh -huh. uh, so that was kind of a breaking in area, which I thought this was going to be all right, I think. <laughs> well, it changed after that, yeah. you know, LZ Center AO, and then we went to LZ Bowman AO. That wasn't good. Then up in the mountains by July, a lot of bad things there. Uh, that day of September 1st, we were in the same exact place we were a week earlier when two of our guys, just our platoon was there, and two, we walked into an ambush and two guys got killed. Mm -hmm. And we went back with the three platoons and at the same place and they were there again and the same, we had lost five guys got killed that day and I don't know how many wounded. Mm -hmm. so, hey, many Christmas, we want to approach this a little different way or something. You know? So, do you have any idea why these after you'd had those casualties the first time, they send you back there a week later. What what was the idea of that? I don't even know if we went to that particular spot for any okay. reason the first time we were there. Uh, I tell you, we were we were in the valley. We were kind of working the platoon size at that time, and we were in the valley. And we were down there. We kept hearing these chainsaws and up in the mountains. And I thought, what the heck's going on here? What are these chainsaws? Well, we found out later it was one of our platoons was at this same hill. It was just a small hill, and they were just cutting the trees off of it. So if they had to get a helicopter in there, they could. Oh. So whether we were there, when we went there with the platoon the first time on August 25th, I don't know if we were at that hill on purpose or we just happened to be going by there. I don't really know. The second time, I'm sure that's why we went there, because there was some stuff there the first time. Uh -huh. <clears throat> And the guy that got shot, this happened in the morning, he came back, he, he was a point man, and he came back and he was shot four or five times through his abdomen. Ooh. And we worked all day to try to, we got him bandaged up, you know, and we, we worked all day to try to get that hill secured. We had another guy go up and they had a machine gun on the other side of it. And so another guy got shot and got killed. And I think some other guys were wounded too. I think there were 19 of us when we came back off that hill. But it got to be late. It was getting dark at night, and we still didn't have that thing secured that we knew of. And our colonel, Colonel Kelly, was circling around his helicopter. I've been talking to him all day on the radio, and he finally told his pilot to land. <laughs> I mean, I thought that was pretty gutsy. Yeah. <laughs> Turned out they were gone. So they got in okay. They dumped off a case of grenades. They got the wounded and, and the killed on there. And uh, they got out of there, and then we kind of, I mean, they, they gave us a whole case of grenades still in a box. They were still in their little cardboard uh, cans they come in, so we were pulling them out, throwing them up to, just to get rid of them, because we couldn't carry them all. And then we ran down that hill until it was so dark. We just, everybody was exhausted, just been going on all day. We, uh -huh. Everybody just sitting down and fell asleep. I mean, you should, should have had somebody on guard. We were in the middle of jungle. I mean, there was, no, there was no path or anything around where we were. So, I mean, I'm just leaning back against the radio and I have the, the mic right here by my, by my hair, head, you know. And so in the morning I wake up and I hear battalion calling us. They've been calling us all night, not knowing what happened to uh -huh. us. So I finally answered them then. And you'd, been, you'd been sleeping through the calls. Huh? Oh yeah, everybody was. <laughs> everybody was just exhausted. So this same Major Beasley, he wanted to court martial our platoon sergeant. We had no lieutenant at that time. Our platoon sergeant was in charge. He wanted to court martial him, and uh, Colonel Kelly put a stop to it. He said no. <laughs> that didn't happen. Oh man. So then the next week he said he wants to put me in for a silver star. <laughs> Hey, I was so the guy that slept through this. <laughs> you talked about this guy getting getting shot several times. Did you always have a medic with you in, on the squad? Usually we did. It was a platoon. It was a whole platoon. I, 
you know, I don't think we did have a medic with us that day. Because it was some of us that were bandaging, bandaging him up. And he mm -hmm. was alive when he left. He laid there all day and he was alive. And uh, we found out the next morning that he died. Uh -huh. yeah. Well. On the operating table. <laughs> oh, shoot. Well, thank you for your service and thank you for this interview. Thank you. You did a good job. <laughs>